photographs you take, the more documentation you present and preserve the story for the next generation. You'll then go to a spot at Gross Rosen that you have not seen, a type of spot in a camp that you haven't seen before. There, Gross Rosen was a working quarry, and it is a grim place. We have been there in recent years. It is a still a working area where quarries are being worked, and it's very, uh, disconcerting if that's the case tomorrow because you will hear sirens and dynamiting and see explosions uh, a quarter or a half mile away while you're going through the camp. But it's a big place, it's a grim place. Numerically, it pales in comparison to some of the other places that you have seen. It's uh, probably the smallest place you've been in uh, numerically. About uh, 60, 65,000 people passed through this camp and one third of them did not survive. There is a video right up front with a survivor that talks about the hell that was Gross Rosen. And last but not least, at the far end of the camp, the goal was to move all of the killing apparatus from Auschwitz to Gross Rosen and keep killing people there. But the Red Army came too quick, so the killing apparatus that you saw at Birkenau was dynamited and was never moved to Gross Rosen. But at the far end of the camp, the last section of Gross Rosen, and it's on an incline, was called Little Auschwitz. It was the space where all those people were going to be taken. I uh, could observe prisoners, uh, so they needed to probably sign a document that when they are going back home, when the work is over for them, they won't be spreading information about what they witnessed during the time they worked here. Uh, of course, they worked in separate groups because official propaganda was telling that uh, concentration camps are inhabited by very dangerous criminals, uh, by communists, by enemies of the Reich, that civilians should be actually very um, alert of, and they couldn't have any possible contact. Uh, but civilians could see the enemies of the Reich, they could see how they look. Probably Germans realized that then the propaganda may actually look completely false. So people needed to oblige, they <coughs> won't be spreading any information when they are going back home. And of course civilians were paid just as they were before the war. To them conditions did not change. Probably about 1943 the stone becomes um, uh, building material uh, and in 1944 they even are bricks and uh, decorative tombs. People didn't have any medical attention for two years. Uh, just in 1942, hospitals were started uh, and diseases were spreading very quickly and encompassing large amounts of people. Uh, plus the work in here for at least 11 hours on average, with one break to eat dinner that people could leave to the camp and then return and no breaks for any sort of rest, toilet, uh, and things like this. They were working and constant running, uh, or at least something that could resemble very quick marching, um, carrying the stones on their backs to flat surface around it. Those that they had to carry could weigh about 40 kilograms, as survivors say. When they were heavier, of course, machines were used to pull them or lift them up. We have just those six cranes still preserved from that time. There are still those that, well, civilians operated, but they belong to the company Deutsche Erdenstein uh, Of course, prisoners were seeking any way out, uh, and I don't mean escapes, usually they were suicides. Uh, people who lost hope, and in the first years of the war it was very easy, as they say, to lose hope. Germans were very powerful, uh, their army was very modern, they were conquering country after country. And uh, in Europe, uh, additionally in Eastern Europe, they were uh, opening concentration camps to liquidate people from there in order to uh, make Europe inhabited by Germans. The cooking uh, was in the upper part uh, that was destroyed in the 60s entirely. 
uh, leaving just the, the ground floor. Uh, so the name kitchen may be misleading in this case, uh, but this is what we actually call this building. Uh, but you won't find many differences between each part of the kitchen. Uh, it's equipped just as it should be. And containers for food, those three next to me, and those four smaller ones in the middle, uh, and those two toros, which could be used probably for cleaning rooms. Uh, right now the stairs lead nowhere, but I guess it would be good to show that there truly was something linking these two parts. Because the only what actually tells that there was an upper part are those round hooks that were supporting the water pipes. And they look pretty grim to many, and usually school kids are trying to make up stories about people being tortured or hanged in here. But it is just with stone water pipes that were very heavy and needed to be secured like this. I'm sure there was more of this, but just these were different. Uh, actually, the initial plans of Germans uh, connected to concentration camps were telling that uh, each prisoner in a concentration camp uh, will uh, receive about 1,600 calories per day, which is supposed to keep him alive for nine, nine months. They wanted to live uh, people longer than they actually were living. Uh, so probably uh, the work factor was equally important as the extermination. Concentration camps were realizing both aims. Uh, the financial one, because from work of prisoners, the SS usually had uh, a lot of money, and extermination was the second one, usually resulting from the first, from the labor. Uh, but concentration camps proved that uh, nine months is basically a little too long especially that nutrition uh, never had 1,600 calories, ever. It was still too little to allow one person to live for nine months. Uh, it also looks different for the propaganda purpose than the true life could be. Uh, well, uh, we didn't have time to read the exhibit more exactly, but on this main exhibit in the building we left, uh, there are propaganda menus that our museum has from uh, one of the sort of staff camps. And these propaganda menus uh, have information like that one person per week received uh, three to five kilograms of potatoes, that meat was distributed at least twice a week, uh, three to four hundred grams per person. Of course, it looks uh, way too good uh, in comparison to what people know about how prisoners were fed. Uh, and I had just one story when a person reading that menu um, actually uh, was arguing with me here while I was guiding the group that I'm telling uh, false information because he read the menu on the exhibit and this what I'm telling is wrong. Uh, but there is an information that this is propaganda menu. Just if any inspection like Red Cross could have access, they have they were receiving a paper with how people are fed. Grossrosen also was having cookbooks in here. Uh, and according to the cookbook standards, uh, any cook, usually German criminal, who was preparing a soup for prisoners, um, was supposed to use from 10 to 15 pieces of lard or margarine for one kettle, so for like 100 people. Uh, having no meat, no bones that they could cook soup on, the fat was essential. Uh, and of course, cook was writing this uh, given amount, 10 or 15 pieces, while in fact, uh, those people who were helping in the kitchen remember uh, two tablespoons of butter uh, added to such soup. Uh, the rest of this fat was of course disappearing. Usually block out the stairs uh, who were bribing cooks to give it to them. Uh, sometimes the SS, because they were fresh calories, they could actually help people going. Uh, prisoners received uh, plain water with some rotten vegetables and no fat at all. Uh, these vegetables uh, were uh, bought in local farms. Uh, farmers also had access because they had to drive here. Uh, prisoners were unloading them and uh, farmers were leaving. Of course, they have to also sign something they won't tell anybody what they saw being here. The camp survivors, uh, the lowest energetical value per three meals was 550, reaching 1,000 in some moments. Uh, so it truly was contributing very highly to mortality. People rarely uh, lived more than two or three months, approximately, of course. Uh, there are survivors who lived longer than that, even three, two years. It just depended on work and some other factors, also on age. Uh, the heaviest prisoners uh, very rarely weighed more than 40 kilograms. It was 38, 39 per person. Very rarely more than that. If so, 40, 41, maybe. Uh, as for those Muslim prisoners, 
they, in this first period, it was probably over 30% of the total population. Uh, so Kostrovin offered pretty harsh conditions. Uh, as for the weight loss, it could be about 20 kilos in four weeks' time. So another four weeks, another month, could mean that if that person won't start to death, they will simply become Muslim. Uh, who are usually occupying the local square, the garbage bins, because next to the kitchen there is one, uh, in search for something that is actually edible. Uh, as for cannibalism, um, I haven't come across any testimony proving that survivors tried. Uh, I assume that some of people who work around crematorium might have tried, but nobody speaks openly about that. Uh, this is what survivors remember mostly, and what I personally heard is eating the grass from this area. And when I was on springtime with one of the survivors here, I don't know what location was that, but something very official, he said that for the first time, ever since he left Prostrozen, he sees how nice it could look like. Because when he was here, everything was great. Uh, and of course, eating the grass wasn't legal. Uh, people could be persecuted very hard for that, usually with flogging here in public, because the Royal Square was also used for public penalties. Uh, but it wasn't stopping anybody. Uh, camp really didn't offer much as to extra feeding, uh, and those conditions that people were undergoing uh, really made Grosrozen to become one of the hardest, at least in their opinion, uh, places uh, to survive.